Uh, welcome back to this next video and this is the part 2 on the Clostridium botulinum. Uh, if I give you a recap of the previous video, in the previous video I've told you that Clostridium botulinum that is a bacterium that is ubiquitously found in the soil and it can actually cause the uh, botulism. Uh, I've told you that it produces a very dangerous toxin which is known as the botulinum toxin under the low oxygen condition and this toxin actually blocks the nerve function and can lead to the respiratory and muscular paralysis. Uh, the biochemical properties of the Clostridium botulinum, I've told you that they are a rod shaped gram positive bacteria, they are a motile bacterium, uh, they, are, they have the ability to form the endospores. Uh, they are uh, anaerobic, uh, that means that they can live and grow in low oxygen condition, but they can tolerate the traces of oxygen because of the presence of the enzyme superoxide dismutase. Uh, they are catalase negative, and then we talked about the pathogenesis, and I've told you that the Clostridium botulinum, uh, they actually, uh, there are actually three types of the uh, Clostridium botulinum. One was the foodborne botulism, which was uh, because of the ingestion of the preformed toxin, and the infant and the wound botulism was actually the presence of the sea botulism in the intestinal tract or the uh, wound. Uh, the uh, toxin produced by the uh, Clostridium botulinum, I told you that it was the most toxic and potent neurotoxin uh, and the microscopic amounts like 1.3 to 2.1 nanogram per kg in humans uh, can even uh, cause illness or deaths in the human beings. The Clostridium botulinum, they were uh, a group of the bacteria which were producing eight different types of the neurotoxins. They were designated by the letters A through H and only type A, B, E, F and H, they were responsible for causing illness in humans. And the gold standard for determining the toxin type is a mouse bioassay and the uh, quantitative PCR. How this toxin is produced in the food, I've told you that this uh, Clostridium botulinum they actually uh, favors the food uh, which have a higher pH like the vegetable and meats because the Clostridium botulinum cannot grow below a pH of the uh, 4.6 so acidic food uh, they are actually not a good, uh, a good food for them to produce the toxin. In this particular video, I want to focus that uh, how this uh, neurotoxin, this botulinum toxin, it actually affects the nervous system and how it can actually lead to the uh, muscular paralysis. Now, if you can see over here, if this is a muscle and this is uh, a neuron, so this will be a neuromuscular junction. So what happens is that uh, during the contraction of the muscles, the, uh, neuro, the uh, neuron that is actually going to release the neurotransmitter to the muscle and the attachment of the neurotransmitter to the muscle will actually be responsible for the contraction of the muscle. Now, what happens is if you talk about a uh, specific neurotransmitter that is the uh, acetylcholine, so initially this acetylcholine is present in this uh, vesicle form. So you can call it actually the uh, neurotransmitter vesicle over here. Now this neurotransmitter vesicle, it actually have got a special protein uh, which actually fuse it with the uh, membrane of the uh, pre, uh, presynaptic neuron and when there is fusion, that fusion is actually releasing the neurotransmitter into the synaptic cleft and they are actually attached on the acetylcholine receptors uh, which are present in the muscles. Now the important proteins that are responsible for this fusion, the fusion of the uh, neurotransmitter vesicle to the membrane of the uh, presynaptic neuron for the release of the acetylcholines, uh, one is known as the synaptobramin which is actually present in this uh, uh, neurotransmitter vesicle that is present over there and two other proteins, one is known as the syntaxin and the other one is known as the SNAP25. So the, uh, these, these are collectively known as the snare proteins, the syntaxin, the SNAP25 and the synaptobramin and their collective function is to fuse this uh, neurotransmitter vesicle to the membrane of the presynaptic neuron so that the acetylcholine get released into the synaptic cleft and they go and attach to the uh, receptors, the acetylcholine receptor on the muscles and this attachment is actually responsible for the contraction of the muscles. Now what happens is that when this botulinum toxin uh, when it enters the uh, uh, neurotrans when it enters the uh, neurons, it is actually uh, stopping to uh, it is actually blocking the release of the acetylcholine. 
Now, this is the uh, structure of the botulinum toxin. Now, this botulinum toxin, it have got two chains. One is known as the light chain, uh, represented by a yellow bar over here. The other one that is known as the heavy chain, and these two chains, they are actually connected to each other by a disulfide bond. So, this is actually the uh, structure of the botulinum toxins. Now, what happens is that the uh, neuro, what the uh, botulinum toxin do, that it utilizes its heavy chain to attach to the uh, neurotrans the uh, neurons and when it attached to the neuron this is actually responsible for the uh, endocytosis of this uh, botulinum toxin so as you can see over here this is the uh, receptor for the uh, botulinum toxin the botulinum toxin is utilizing its heavy chain to attach to this receptor and when the heavy chain it attaches to this receptor it is actually going for the uh, endocytosis of the whole toxin now when the botulinum toxin it enters into the uh, neuron what happens is that this uh, disulfide bond that is broken down and the light and the heavy chain they are dissociated from each other so if you can see over here the heavy chain is still in association with the receptor but the light chain that have been released uh, what this light chain do is that it is actually having the enzymatic activity and it is going to break down the snare proteins as you can see over here it is going for the breakdown of the uh, snap 25 the uh, syntaxin or the uh, vam protein they are actually the vesicle associated membrane proteins but the thing is that this when this light chain that is released that is going for the breakdown of the uh, snare proteins like the cyanotobrevin the snap 25 and the uh, vam protein now what happens is that when these uh, protein these snare proteins they are broken down this neurotransmitter vesicle it actually do not have the ability to uh, interact with the uh, membrane of the uh, presynaptic neuron if you can see over here the synaptic fusion complex that do not form because the members of the uh, synaptic fusion complex that has been degraded by the light chain of the botulinum toxin now if the uh, neurotransmitter vesicle it do not have the ability to fuse with this particular membrane that means that the release of the acetylcholine that will be blocked and if the release of the acetylcholine that is blocked that means there will be no release of the acetylcholine into the synaptic cleft there will be no attachment of the acetylcholine to the acetylcholine receptor and if there is no attachment to the acetylcholine receptor there will be no muscular contraction what this means is that the uh, muscles they will not be able to uh, uh, contract in the absence of the acetylcholine now if you see over here it is actually the neurotoxin uh, this botulinum toxin is blocking the release of this neurotransmitter and the condition that it causes is known as uh, a, fl a flaccid paralysis now this flaccid paralysis it is actually a neurological condition which is characterized by the weakness or paralysis and reduced muscle tone uh, without other obvious causes like the trauma now what happened during the trauma is that there is weakness and paralysis of the muscle but in this particular case the botulinum toxin is actually uh, blocking the uh, release of the acetylcholine thereby weakening and paralyzing the uh, muscles and reducing the uh, muscle tone now, uh, the, uh, another important thing is uh, uh, what is infant botulism. So that is what has happened when you uh, talk about the foodborne botulism. If you are taking the uh, botulism, uh, the uh, botulinum toxin in the food, that food is going to uh, actually move into the uh, neuron, thereby blocking the release of the uh, uh, neurotransmitters. Now, uh, the, in, another important thing is what is the infant botulism, the second type of the botulism. Now the infant botulism that actually affect infants under the uh, age of 12 months but that most uh, but mostly under two months of age now how this infant botulism it occurs now this uh, occurs when the infants they eat food such as the honey that contain spores of the uh, botulinum that germinate colonize and produce the neurotoxin 
in the infant's intestinal tract because the uh, uh, intestinal tract of these infants that has not developed to its uh, full strength therefore the spores of the clostridium motulinum they can actually germinate colonize and produce neurotoxin in the in infant's intestinal tract now for this reason the u.s food and drug administration the center for disease control and prevention which is known as the cdc and the american um, academy of pediatrics they recommended that honey not be given to the children under one year of age uh, because if they are contaminated with the spore of the uh, the spore of the clostridium botulinum that can actually cause this infant botulism in the uh, infants also the fruits and vegetables it should be properly washed before being fed to the uh, infants now, when you talk about the uh, laboratory isolation or the uh, diagnosis, if you are getting a suspected patient, uh, so how you are going to actually uh, diagnose uh, or isolate this particular organisms. Now, in the laboratory, the clostridium botulinum that is usually isolated in specialized media like the uh, tryptose sulfide cyclosidine, which for short is known as the TSC, or you can actually use the Robertson cooked meat medium in an anaerobic environment with less than 2% oxygen. Uh, now, this can be uh, this uh, less than 2% oxygen environment can be achieved by several commercial kits uh, that uses a chemical reaction to replace the oxygen with the carbon dioxide, thereby providing the anaerobic environment. Now, it grows uh, best between the pH of 4.8 and 7. And uh, therefore, uh, it cannot and it cannot utilize or use lactose as a primary carbon source. Now, the organism, if they cannot utilize uh, lactose as a primary carbon source, that is one of the uh, characteristic important for the biochemical identification of the Clostridium botulinum. Now, this result can be further confirmed by the biochemical characters of the organism that we discussed in the uh, previous video, that they are uh, gram positive, or they are non-motile, they are catalase negative. Those uh, biochemical parameters, they can also help you in the identification or the diagnosis of the Clostridium botulinum. Uh, if you are talking about the uh, toxin as I've told you in the previous video that the toxin identification is actually uh, done by the uh, mouse bioassay and we had a detailed discussion on that in the uh, previous video. If you talk about the uh, symptoms of the uh, Clostridium botulinum, so once in the body the toxin binds to the nerve endings that join the muscles that we discussed in detail. Now this prevents the nerves from signaling uh, to the muscle to contract. So when there is no muscular contraction, the first symptoms, they are actually the nausea, vomiting, weakness and vertigo. This vertigo mean uh, the dizziness. Uh, and the first symptoms, they are actually followed by neurological systems like uh, visual impairments, uh, which can include the blurred or double vision, the loss of the normal throat and mouse functions, like there will be difficulty speaking and swallowing uh, because there is uh, the muscle tone that has been affected. There can be dry mouth, the throat and tongue, and sore throat. Uh, there is general fatigue, uh, lack of muscle coordination, and difficulty in breathing. Now, this uh, neurotoxin that can also have the, uh, the gastrointestinal symptoms, which may include the abdominal pain, diarrhea, or constipation. Now, the death because of this uh, neurotoxin, it actually occurs uh, when the respiratory failure and airway obstruction is there. When the muscles of the uh, respiratory system, they are affected, that actually leads to the death of the individual. Now, when the diaphragm and the chest muscle, they become fully involved. What I mean by that is that when the muscles of the uh, diaphragm and chest muscles, they are affected, breathing is badly affected, and it can result in death from asphyxia. And then asphyxia is actually a condition arising when the body is deprived of oxygen. So if the muscles, they are affected, that means there will be deprivation of the oxygen. Uh, and if the respiratory system fails, that actually leads to the uh, death of the individual. Uh, if you talk about the treatment of the Clostridium botulinum uh, in case of the uh, in case of a diagnosis of suspicion of botulism, patients should be hospitalized immediately, even if the diagnosis uh, or tests they are pending. Uh, if the uh, botulism is suspected, uh, if you do not have uh, the uh, results of your test, but if you are suspecting uh, that particular patient of botulism, the patient should be treated immediately with uh, 
polyvenet antitoxin now this polyvenet antitoxin that means that they are polyvenet in nature so they can actually interact with uh, multiple toxins and as i've told you that uh, out of eight only five of the antitoxins they have the uh, ability to cause diseases in the human beings so this polyvenet antitoxins they are actually um, administered uh, intravenously in order to reduce the mortality so if you do not know the specific antitoxin you can actually utilize this polyvenet which can actually interact with multiple toxins now is respiratory failure or uh, pharyngeal paralysis that is actually the primary cause of death from the botulism so proper ventilation should be maintained in all cases using an artificial breathing apparatus uh, to supply oxygen that means that uh, there should be a supply of oxygen to the patient and if ventilation is needed you should uh, be available with a proper ventilator so in case the condition of the patient worsens you can actually utilize those uh, ventilator to supply oxygen to the individual uh, to uh, reduce the chances of death now there are currently only three antioxidant therapies available and these are the one is known as the GlaxoSmithKline trivalent type a b and e and as the name indicate they are only effective against the uh, type a uh, toxin the type b toxin and the type e toxin and these are the common toxin which cause diseases in the human beings uh, the other one is known as the NP018, uh, which is heptavalent, and it is actually uh, polyvalent in nature, and it can actually bind from uh, through the toxin A to G. That means it can bind to A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So this is actually the uh, heptavalent. It can bind to seven types of the toxin. Therefore, that is known as the heptavalent. Uh, another one is known as the uh, baby big and this is actually the uh, botulism immune uh, globulin intravenous and it is actually uh, for the uh, infants under the age of one year now on the contrary most cases of the infant botulism they are self-limiting and new need to recover from the infection when uh, given proper supportive care like if you give them the uh, oxygen if you give them the uh, uh, ventilation system so in most of the cases they are self-limiting but if that is not self-limiting then you have to go for this uh, uh, antitoxin strategy uh, if you talk about the wound botulism, so as I've told you that in the wound botulism, uh, the organism itself is present in the uh, wound. So you have to use antibiotics to kill those particular uh, Clostridium botulinum cells in the wound. So in case of the antibiotics, the most effective one uh, in most of the cases is the uh, amoxicillin antibiotic, which can actually kill the uh, Clostridium botulinum cells, which are present in the uh, wound botulism. Now, how you can uh, actually prevent the botulism? Now, the good thing is you can actually uh, very easily prevent the botulism from happening. The reason is that the control of foodborne botulism is based almost entirely on thermal destruction of the spores or the uh, toxins or inhibiting spore germination into bacteria and allowing cell to grow and produce toxins in the food. That means if you are properly heating your food, that is not only going to kill the spores of the particular Clostridium botulinum, but if they have produced the toxin, that heat is also enough to destroy the toxins, thereby you can prevent the botulism. Now the uh, important things that you should keep in mind when you want to prevent botulism is that you have to use approved heat processes for commercially and home canned food. That means uh, if you are making the cans in the uh, in home, if you are commercially preparing them, you have to use the approved heat processes uh, like pressure can low acid food such as the corn or green beans meat or pro poultry so you have to provide them you have to cane them under pressure so this pressure and not only kills the spores uh, but when you heat them that heat is actually going to destroy the uh, toxin as well now one of the most common causes of food one botulism is improperly home canned food so if you are using the approved heat processes that means you will be properly caning your food at home that means you can actually prevent the botulism so especially the low acid foods such as the vegetable and meats uh, you have to use a pressure cooker or a pressure caner to allow water to reach 240 and 250 degree fahrenheit a temperature that can kill the spores so if you can kill the uh, spores at this particular temperature this particular temperature is also going to kill the uh, any toxin if that is present in the food 
Now you have to discard either swollen, gassy, or spoiled cane food. If a cane, if a cane is swollen, if uh, if you are if it is suspected that there is gas in the uh, cane, or if it is the food is spoiled in the cane, you should not use those particular cane food. Now what you have to do with this uh, swollen, gassy, or spoiled cane food is that you have to double bag the cans or jars with plastic bags. You have to tightly close them and you have to then place the bags in the trash outside the home now you have to double bake it because you want to keep it out of the reach of the humans and pets now do not taste or eat foods from the containers that are leaking if you are using uh, some canes and if they are leaking if they have bulges or they are swollen they look damaged or cracked or seem abnormal in appearance you should not eat or taste from those particular containers now do not use products that uh, spurt liquid or foam when the container is open. When you open the container and if you use some kind of the uh, foam in this particular container, you should not use them, you should discard them. Now boil home processed low acid canned food for 10 minutes prior to serving. If there is food in the can and if you want to serve it, you should boil it for at least 10 minutes. If you are living at higher altitude, you have to add a one minute for each 1000 feet of elevation. Uh, for example, if you are living at a feet of uh, at the height of 10,000 feet, that means you have to boil the food for at least 20 minutes. Now you have to refrigerate our leftover and cooked foods uh, within two hours after cooking, one hour if the temperature is above 90 degree Fahrenheit. So I hope you get the idea of the uh, clostridium botulinum and how it is affecting the nervous system so if you like the video uh, please subscribe to my channel share it with your friends and uh, hit the like button